The concept of winner takes all in competitive learning may lead to so-called dead clusters that are only being created because of some outliers and are never or very seldomly updated. And so this leads to a cluster organization that doesn't really reflect the topology of the data. We might get as many clusters where there is very little data as where there is a lot of data. So an alternative idea is to give up on this or to modify somewhat this idea of winner takes all and allow the updating of other clusters as well alongside the winning cluster. And this is one of the features of the so-called self-organizing maps. This is a type of neural network that was introduced um, in Finland by Teuvo Kohonen in the 1980s. So these self-organizing maps are um, a form of neural networks, but their particular feature is that their nodes are thought of as really dots in a 2D space. So in other words, this neural network is in fact a 2D topological map. Each node of the network is placed somewhere on the uh, 2D grid and in fact, the network is going to evolve so that the location of these points is going to be changed throughout the training in such a way that the map that you are going to get is in some sense going to reflect the topology of your uh, training data set, even though that data set might have lots of features, it might be really multidimensional. But through self-organizing maps, you are embedding that kind of multidimensional data set into an easy to visualize 2D uh, topological map and you do that through uh, some form of neural network learning. And so <clears throat> the nodes of this um, uh, self-organizing map are typically initialized on a rectangular grid. It's not the only version. You can also take something else than a, re a rectangular grid. And learning this data set is about updating the location of the nodes in this 2D map in such a way that it reflects the topology of the data set. And you start training and when you train on a new data point, what you do, as we've seen in this module also for um, uh, online k-means and uh, adaptive resonance theory, you're going to select the closest node. And you see each node in this neural network is going to have uh, associated with a vector with the same dimension as your data point. So uh, evaluating the distance between your training data point and the node in the network is going to be easy based on, for example, the Euclidean distance. And so you're going to select the closest node um, in the d-dimensional space uh, that your data is coming from, and that's going to be the so-called the best matching unit or BMU. And so this weight, this um, uh, d-dimensional um, vector associated to the BMU is going to be updated towards this new data point. But the point is that you see this BMU is sitting in a 2D topological map. And so when you are updating the weight um, vector behind your BMU, you are also going to update the weights of the units sitting next to the BMU in this two-dimensional grid. Um, the update rule for the data point uh, X and, and for this um, uh, best matching unit uh, neuron, um, for example, MIJ, I'm indicating this with two indices, I and J, uh, just to highlight one more time that we are dealing with a 2D topological map. So uh, I and J are the uh, locations on the X and on the Y axis of this particular neuron uh, that's the best matching unit for this data point. And so once you have this uh, data point and you identify that the best matching uh, unit is uh, this neuron found at location or at index uh, i and j, you are going to have this update rule for all the neurons in your self-organizing map in the following way. You are updating neuron uh, with index um, uh, k and l on the x-axis on and, and on the y-axis in such a way that <clears throat> this is a function of how uh, far away this new data point is from your uh, uh, neuron in the d-dimensional space. There is a learning factor, as we've discussed before in, in um, uh, lots of stochastic gradient descent algorithms, but the new, new thing is this function here, this E of KL, this is the update on the unit at index K and L, 
and it's a function of this best matching unit ij uh, this function e is a so-called neighborhood function which is going to decrease as kl is further away from the index location ij of the best matching unit and so what this means is that you are going to have this kind of update where obviously you are going to update the best matching unit but in fact you are updating everyone but you're going to update much more those units that are close to the BMU and much less um, those that are further away from the best matching unit IJ. And, and in fact, the, the, um, the furthest you, you are from IJ, you are going to have almost a negligible update, but there is going to be a small update uh, anyway. There is this visualization on the right hand side that um, uh, I, I got from Wikipedia. This is the um, reference uh, and um, the uh, credits uh, for this picture and the question of course is what do we choose for this error function uh, and standard things are for example you can just take zero one and, and you would have a threshold for what is close enough and, and if you are close enough this is going to be one and if you are not close enough this is going to be zero um, very often, because you want to use calculus uh, in, in some of these considerations, it's maybe um, a better choice to have something which is, um, you know, differentiable. And, and so very often, in fact, people are taking a Gaussian function, um, which is going to have its maximum around the best matching unit and is going to um, decrease very quickly in a Gaussian fashion the further away you are from this uh, IJ. And obviously this learning rate uh, is going to have the same logic as we've had for other algorithms. You are going to decrease it throughout the learning and you've got to be careful not to decrease it too fast because then you don't learn enough. Um, but, but also um, not to decrease it too slowly because then, then the learning is going to be uh, too slow. Um, there are a number of practicalities that I want to mention with um, self-organizing maps. One is regarding this uh, initialization of, um, of the weights of your uh, nodes. Um, I mentioned that you know you can initialize them to some um, random points or maybe from to some random points in your training data set. But there is also an idea that, that in fact uh, makes learning a little bit faster. You could take them from the space of the first principal components of your data point. So first you would run a PCA on, on your data point and uh, on your data set, and then you are going to choose the weights of these nodes from the space of the first principal components. The other thing I want to mention is how do you interpret a self-organizing map? And one of the attractive points of self-organizing maps is that it's offering you a so-called a semantic map. It's offering you, you know, meaning to your data points. And you are getting this because the whole idea of self-organizing maps is that similar data points are going to be grouped close together to neighboring units in, in this um, uh, 2D grid. Uh, and this is because of how the map is trained. Um, vectors that are close by are going to have similar influences on your uh, self-organizing map. And so when you see some data points being drawn together, uh, that's going to have a meaning that they are uh, similar in the original um, dimensional um, space that, that they're coming from. The other point <clears throat> and, and how you can uh, interpret your um, uh, self-organizing map is that it's offering you a discrete approximation of the distribution of the data set. You're going to have more neurons to areas where you have more data points. And so that's going to give you a visualization of the distribution of your data points in 2D, which is very attractive. Um, it, this may have been very difficult to achieve in the original D-dimensional space where the data is coming from. Self-organizing maps, um, in fact, um, are um, uh, going out of favor nowadays. They do have a number of weaknesses. One of them is that it's not a generative model. So in, in other words, it doesn't really offer you an ex explicit description of the uh, data distribution. Another one is that they tend to be very slow to train. And in fact, they tend to have big difficulties also in terms of um, speed of training. Um, when you have data with mixed types, in other words, data that has uh, both a categorical type and um, you also have numerical data.